this is Dr. Shanali Chandra. In this video, we're going to take up Obzengaini questions from the recent postgrad entrance examination that is INICET November 2022. The purpose of this video is to identify the important areas and topics from which questions have been asked and also to see the pattern of questions and to see how to tackle them best. Secondly, since these are recall based questions, they may not be an exact replica of uh, the questions that were exactly in the examination. However, they are going to be as close to the uh, questions as possible. So let's begin and have a look at the first question. Now, they had asked which of the following methods is not used for first trimester medical termination of pregnancy. Now, dilatation and curettage, manual vacuum aspiration, these are definitely uh, first trimester surgical methods of MTP. Mifeprestone and mesoprostol is uh, a medical method of first trimester MTP and et extra amniotic ethacridine uh, infusion, however, is a method for second trimester medical termination of pregnancy. So that's a fairly straightforward question here. Now let's have a look at the next question. Um, arrange the following in correct sequence as events during labor. <clears throat> so if you look at the events occurring during labor, during mechanism of labor, the first event to take place is engagement of the fetal head, which is also accompanied by a descent and flexion at the same time. Descent and flexion of the fetal head continues throughout the course of labor. After that, once the head reaches the pelvic floor, internal rotation of the head takes place and then we see an event that is crowning. Crowning means that the scalp is visible at the introitus. After that, the head delivers by extension followed by restitution and external rotation of the head. So if you look at the options provided, you know that engagement is the first step, right? So option number C and D are entirely ruled out right so the correct sequence of events is to choosing from option number a and b is option number b right so engagement then crowning uh, then uh, restitution and then external rotation among the options provided now let's have a look at the next question pregnant woman exposed to diethyl stilbesterol causes which of the following cancer in the female offspring and the correct answer to this question is clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina, which by itself is a rare cancer. Now, having said that, yes, let us also look at the other diethyl stilbesterol related uh, female abnormalities or abnormalities in the female offspring, right? So, uh, on, let me also emphasize in the very beginning that uh, currently we are no longer using diethyl stilbesterol in pregnant women at all because of uh, the risk of this cancer in the female offspring. But there are other abnormalities also that can happen in the female offspring and the most com common overall abnormality is vaginal adenosis. So, look at these statements that I have highlighted taken from uh, the textbook that is Desire's uh, Medical um, Gynae and Oncology. So, look at this, approximately 60% of women with a neutral death exposure have vaginal adenosis that means cervical-like epithelium in the vagina. It's a benign condition that does not require any treatment unless symptomatic. Other than that, there can be other, uh, you know, anatomic uh, deformities of the upper vagina and the cervix as well, like transverse cervical uh, ridges, transverse vaginal ridges, cervical collars and vaginal hoods. And there can also be uh, uterine anomalies uh, in female offspring exposed to uh, DES in utero. And among the vagina, uh, uterine anomalies, most common is the hypoplastic uterus. And... Uh, Look at this line. Essentially, no DES has been prescribed to pregnant women since 1971 when the US FDA issued an alert regarding the risk of vaginal clear cell adenocarcinoma for females exposed in utero. So, these are the test related abnormalities in the female offspring, uh, female offsprings who've been exposed to DES in utero if their mothers, if the pregnant one mothers had been prescribed DES and we currently don't use this drug anymore. Now, let's have a look at the next question. Pretty straightforward question and a repeat question. So, what is the first sign of magnesium sulfate toxicity? Now, magnesium sulfate normal levels in or normal therapeutic levels in the serum are somewhere around 4 to 7 milliequivalent per liter. And when the levels exceed 
10 milli equivalent per liter uh, that is the time when the first sign of toxicity arises and it is loss of deep tendon reflexes loss of knee jerk is the first sign of toxicity with further increasing magnesium levels in the serum when they cross 12 milli equivalent per liter respiratory depression can happen followed by respiratory arrest and if levels rise even further then cardiac arrest can follow so respiratory depression is not the first sign of toxicity flushing is a common side effect of magnesium sulfate treatment it's not a sign of toxicity then oliguria that is decreased urine output now oliguria by itself is not a sign of magnesium sulfate toxicity see magnesium is excreted in the urine so if a woman with preeclampsia or eclampsia has decreased urine output uh, more particularly if she has decreased gfr then magnesium sulfate toxicity can be precipitated so the correct answer here is option number a now let's have a look at the next question what is the correct sequence of events while performing dilatation and curettage right so dilatation and curettage when you have to perform so basically you're introducing instruments inside the uterine cavity and like i keep telling you that before introducing any instruments inside the uterine cavity it is very important to perform a clinical examination to know what is the size and position of the uterus right so before we put anything inside the uterus whether a curate whether a cervical dilator whether a uterine sign whatever determining the size and position of the uterus is the first step so having known that these options it's a fairly these options are completely ruled out right so option number c is the correct answer so let's see here determining the size and position of the uterus yes fourth step of the in the sequence number four then sounding the uterus now introducing the uterine sound inside the uterus to know the utero cervical length to know the position of the uterus it's often said that pregnant uterus should not be sounded and yes uh, we do not sound a pregnant uterus we avoid that uh, after sounding the uterus uh, cervical dilatation will be done and once the cervix has been dilated then a curettage will be done so the correct sequence of events is 4 1 2 3 now let's have a look at the next question they had asked what would be defined as primary amenorrhea so i'm not sure whether they had given this statement however i have given this statement to help us understand the question a girl not attaining menarche by the age of dash years and breast development by dash stage so if you recall the definition of primary amenorrhea it says that primary amenorrhea is defined as the absence of menses by 13 years of age when there is no visible development of secondary sexual characteristics or by 15 years of age in the presence of normal secondary sexual characteristics so to attempt this question you had to know some idea about tanner staging so tanner stage one is pre-pubertal okay and tanner stage two is when the breast budding starts and three four five are uh, you know towards adult breast development so tanner stage two and three would mean that the breast development has started so once the breast development has started the age at which we will call it as primary amenorrhea is 15 so these two are out as options as correct answers now option number a and b 12 years tanner stage 1 14 years tanner stage 1 right now if a young girl is 12 years of age and she has pre-pubertal breasts i will not call it as primary amenorrhea because the age is 13 years when i should be calling it as primary amenorrhea so 12 years tanner stage 1 is out so the closest that we have is option number b 14 years tanner stage 1 this would be defined as primary amenorrhea because she's crossed the cutoff threshold age of 13 and has primary amenorrhea yet has no breast development so 14 years tanner stage 1 would be the correct answer now let's have a look at the next question now what is the recommended number of minimal antenatal visits as per who world health organization so uh, the confusion here most women would have had between option number four uh, option number four that is eight and option number a that is four 
so the number of visits uh, is for minimum by the government of india and who has this uh, 2016 who anc model which says eight contacts right so the government of india is still following the minimum number of antenatal visits as four but the who has mentioned minimum number as eight so eight contact so that would be the correct answer since that specifically specified in the question as per who now let's have a look at the next question uh, the image shown represents what right so in this question i think they had shown you an image of the um, fetal heart rate tracing and uh, some students said that there were no contraction tracing along with the fetal heart rate tracing and maybe the question was direct and straight forward like this or maybe the question was about the non stress test but nonetheless this image was asked and the image shown represents non stress test right so non stress test we know because uh, the contractions uh, tracing is not given in this graph in this trace Uh, a contraction stress test is done and uh, is used to be done earlier where we used to induce uterine contractions with oxytocin and then see the pattern of fetal heart rate tracing along with the contraction so this is not a contraction stress test in a cardiotocography cardiotocography is done as intrapartum fetal heart rate assessment and again it will have both the traces cardio for fetal heart rate tracing and toco for the uterine contraction tracing so this is not that and in the image of non stress test we are looking for uh, the baseline fetal heart rate characteristics we are looking at the beat to beat variability and more importantly to call it as a reactive non stress test we are looking at the presence of accelerations right and there should be no deceleration so in this uh, graph here we are not seeing any fetal heart rate deceleration so the image shown represents a non stress test so again i want to emphasize that in this examination they had asked questions on non stress test image based questions on accelerations and decelerations as well so uh, non stress test cardiotocography is an important topic uh, for your examinations now let's have a look at the next question again uh, which of the following statements regarding late decelerations is false right so let's have a look at these options one by one they are smooth and gradual uh, that seems to be a true statement that is indeed a true statement it starts after uterine contractions and end after the uterine contraction is over that's also a true statement not followed by an acceleration that is also a true statement i will come to the explanation part also in a while now fall in fetal heart rate is more than 10 to 20 beats above the baseline now this statement in this form is absolutely incorrect because uh, the fall in fetal heart rate has to be below the baseline and not above the baseline so this is the false statement here right now let's also emphasize on the other statements with the help of these uh, cardiotocography images so these are two images here side by side right uh, so image on the left here is showing the early deceleration or we call it as the type 1 deceleration and we can see that the type 1 deceleration is an exact mirror image of the uh, uterine contraction right so here on the right side this is a late deceleration or type 2 deceleration right where the drop in fetal heart rate is coming after the contraction has already set in and started and by the time the contraction is over the fetal heart rate is still low so it is delayed it takes some time to recover back right so that is the definition of late decelerations to specify in a little more detail let's have a look at this right so the image here is showing a late deceleration okay see this is the fetal heart rate tracing this is the contraction tracing and it takes some time a delay of somewhere around at least 30 seconds for the fetal heart rate to reach the 
lowest point to reach the nadir right so it is slow and gradual right and the fetal heart rate starts dropping once the contraction is well started right and it recovers late so this is a typical late deceleration and to compare it with an early deceleration look at this early deceleration is also slow and gradual right it's also slow and slow and gradual meaning that from the onset of the drop in fetal heart rate to the nadir that's the lowest point in fetal heart rate it will take more than 30 seconds to reach there but the fetal heart rate starts dropping when the contraction starts it reaches its lowest point when the contraction is at its peak and by the time the contraction is over the fetal heart rate has recovered back so early deceleration is an exact mirror image of the contraction right so this is how we are going to compare early and late decelerations now we had the fourth option of uh, followed by accelerations or not so let's have a look at the third type of deceleration also which is the variable deceleration a variable deceleration has variable onset first of all right that means it can come with contraction after contraction before contraction any time right so variable onset and it is very rapidly it reaches the nadir so once the fetal heart rate starts dropping it reaches its nadir in less than 30 seconds so it's a very sharp deceleration it's not slow and gradual like later early deceleration right so variable decelerations have variable onset they are not related to contractions they are related to cord compression and they reach the nadir very quickly in less than 30 seconds so they're very sharp and abrupt in onset okay so these are variable decelerations secondly variable decelerations are the ones which can be followed by accelerations we call it as shoulders of acceleration okay so it is the variable decelerations which may not always be followed by acceleration but they can be followed by accelerations in fetal heart rate pattern see here so there's this is the fetal heart rate pattern there's a variable deceleration and it is followed by and it has got uh, followed by and also before the deceleration there is a peak of acceleration slight peak of acceleration these are called as shoulders of acceleration so they are present with variable decelerations not early or late decelerations and variable decelerations are because of cord compression Late decelerations are because of utero-placental insufficiency and they are a sign of fetal hypoxia and early decelerations are occurring because of fetal head compression. So these are important questions. Again, I emphasize it is very important to revise the fetal uh, cardiotocography that is intrapartum fetal heart rate monitoring and NST. These are important topics for your examination now let's have a look at the next question again another question based on this uh, you know fetal monitoring so this is a question which says again it's a repeat question has been asked many times which of the following is not included in biophysical profile biophysical profile is also the manning score and uh, daily fetal movement count or whatever it was given in the question maybe a kick count was given so daily fetal movement count is not included in biophysical profile amniotic fluid volume fetal tone fetal breathing and uh, uh, fetal gross body movement and nst these are the five components which are included in biophysical profile dfmc is not one of them now let's have a look at the next question all of the following are causes of uterine dysfunction during labor except right so you don't need to mug up too many lists for answering this question uterine dysfunction during labor or uterine dystocia during labor or abnormal labor progression i have emphasized remember the three p's right power passage and passenger okay so yes chorioamnionitis is going to be uh, is is uh, 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 chorioamnionitis 
is a situation where there is infection of the chorion and amnion and uh, the uterus is uh, tense and tender in that situation and it can also interfere with uterine contractility causing uterine dysfunction. So chorionitis, yes, can cause uterine dysfunction. High fetal station when the head is high up in the pelvis for whatever reason, maybe CPD, maybe a deflexed head for whatever reason if there is a high fetal station that will ultimately yes can lead to uterine dysfunction and poor labor progression right and neuraxial blockage like say epidural analgesia is also seen to cause uterine dysfunction during labor however multiparity you see multiparous labors or labors in multiparous women are faster as compared to labors in nulliparous women. So multiparity is not a cause of uterine dysfunction during labor, right? So you could answer this question by elimination. However, if you look at the list of causes of dystocia in term vertex singleton presentations, this is a list which has been taken up from Williams textbook of obstetrics. So there can be fetal characteristics, right? So everything will fall under the three P's, right? Power, passage, and passenger. So passenger is the fetus. So fetal malpresentations, malpositions, macrosomia, fetal anomalies, right? These are the fetal characteristics which can interfere with the progress of labor. It can lead to dystocia. Intrapartum findings like hydroamnios, it's, it's, a, it's a big baby, uh, it's a you know overly distended uterus, uh, which will have difficulty in contracting chorioamnionitis, again, affects with uterine contractility. Neuraxial analgesia, epidural analgesia can affect with uterine contractility, right? Higher station at labor onset, I told you, if the head is high up, means there could be a possibility of cephalopelvic disproportion or deflexed head. And poor maternal pushing uh, will obviously affect uh, with labor progression. So these are the reasons. And another reason, see, regional block or giving uh, epidural analgesia, they can affect with, they can cause an effect with maternal pushing also, interfere with maternal bearing down efforts and then can lead to dystocia. So these are the uh, causes of dystocia. If you look at the maternal characteristics, uh, nulliparity, increasing maternal age, obesity, right um, or any other abnormal pelvis types right so these are the maternal characteristics which can cause dystocia or poor labor progression as well or contribute to dystocia in some way or the other so these are the lists of uh, causes of dystocia in term vertex singleton presentations now i don't think that you need to really mug up this, this huge list, but you, if you understand the logic behind labor progression, uh, if you remember the three P's of power, passage, and passenger, then you should be arriving at the right answer simply by eliminating the options as well. Now let's have a look at the next question. Which of the following statements regarding estimation of gestational age, that period of gestation is wrong? So look at the option number A. It's calculated from the last day of bleeding of the LMP, that's last menstrual period. So for all practical purposes, everywhere in gynecology obstetrics, when I say la last menstrual period, it's always referring to the day the bleeding started. That is the first day of bleeding. So it's calculated from the first day of bleeding. This statement is definitely wrong statement. This is a false statement. So that's your answer. Now option number B, that is first trimester ultrasound uh, measurement of crown rump length is the best for assessment of gestational age. That is the true statement. Date of embryo transfer is needed for calculation uh, for gestational age in in vitro fertilization pregnancy because in IVF pregnancies we will calculate the period of gestation or the embryonic age based on the date of the embryo transfer right because the LMP may not be that reliable because from the last menstrual period what has been done is giving the woman stimulation agents to achieve ovulation right so that can take uh, a variable amount of time so the calculation is based on the date of embryo transfer that's also a true statement and all the above statements are wrong that's a wrong statement right so it's calculated from the first day of lmp not the last day of lmp
Now let's look at the next question. Uh, vulval cancer is seen most frequently in which age group women? Um, Vulval cancer is frequently being asked in your examination. It's an important topic to cover. It's an important cancer to add to your reading list, right? So vulval cancer is most frequently seen in postmenopausal women who are uh, beyond their 70s. And the cancer that arises in these postmenopausal most often arises over atrophic vulval changes and uh, over uh, atrophic uh, lesions of the vulva like uh, lichen uh, sclerosis, right, or atrophic uh, vulvitis. So... Uh, one of the uns one of the age groups here is the 70s and we are also seeing vulval cancer in younger women now which is hpv related vulval cancer which can be seen in women as young as 45 years of age so yes vulval cancer most frequently is seen in which age group 45 to 85 see option number a 15 to 45 it's not seen in younger reproductive age group women it's mostly seen in this age group of women so that's the answer of choice right if they had asked you most commonly then yes of course it's more often in uh, postmenopausal women beyond their 70s but we're seeing vulval cancer now in younger women also which is hpv related vulval cancer so the second question is which of the following is not a risk factor for vulval carcinoma so like i told you that when women have uh, even older women have vulval cancer it develops over uh, vulval uh, dystrophies uh, like particularly like uh, lichen sclerosis right so vulval dystrophy is a risk factor yes when it is seen in younger women, younger women with vulval cancer, they have been associated with HPV. Again, HPV 16, HPV 33, these are the HPVs uh, types which are most particularly related with vulval cancer. And smoking is also identified as a risk factor for vulval cancer in these HPV related younger women, right? So HPV and smoking are also risk factors for vulval cancer. Vulval hamartoma, on the other hand, is not a risk factor for vulval cancer. So let me also remind you, vulval cancer is an important topic to read up for your examinations. Now, next statement, a straightforward direct question, false statement regarding the placenta is, and we all know that umbilical cord has got three vessels and not two vessels, two umbilical uh, arteries and one umbilical vein. So this is definitely a false statement. It weighs about 500 grams. Its thickness is about 2.5 centimeter. It's often described as discoidal in shape. Oval is also fine if they want to describe it like that. But it definitely doesn't have got two vessels normally. It has three vessels normally. The umbilical cord has three vessels normally. right? So that's the false statement here. Next question, which of the following is not a reversible contraceptive method? So the language of the question could have been a reversible contraceptive method or they may have called it LARC, long acting reversible contraceptive methods. So Depo-Provera, that is injectable progesterone, uh, injectable progestin, that is um, injection uh, of Depo-Midroxy progesterone acetate, right? Injectable DMPA, then that is a uh, three monthly injectable progesterone only contraception right it's a reversible method the progesterone implants they are also reversible copper tea is reversible mirina is reversible tubal sterilization is for all practical purposes counseled as an irreversible or permanent method of contraception so this is not a reversible method that's a straightforward question now let's have a look at the next question a 35 peaks primary gravida comes with the complaint of abdominal pain and blurring of vision. Her blood pressure is 170 by 110. Uterus size corresponds to 34 weeks. Contractions are present. Fetal heart rate is fine. Per vaginal examination shows she is 2 cm dilated and partially effaced. What's the best management, right? So she has blurring of vision. She has high BP, right? So she has signs and symptoms of impending eclampsia also. And obviously she's fitting into the definition of severe 
preeclampsia. So when she has severe preeclampsia and she is already beyond 34 weeks, then there is no point in continuing the pregnancy further right and moreover in this question she's already gone into labor it seems right so one should go for termination of pregnancy now this is by itself not a direct indication for an emergency cesarean section at all right vaginal delivery can be achieved so to control the bp we have to give antihypertensives since she has signs and symptoms of impending eclampsia she has severe preeclampsia uh, prophylactic magnesium sulfate should also be given for caesar prophylaxis and termination of the pregnancy we can go for in this particular situation augmentation of labor can be done if the contractions are deemed to be ineffective or inadequate so term this is the right answer there is absolutely no conservative management in such a situation once the woman with severe preeclampsia has crossed 34 weeks of gestation and corticosteroids and deliver at 37 weeks that also is not the right answer i mean had she been less than 34 weeks right had she had no signs and symptoms of impending eclampsia then a conservative management would have been attempted but in this particular situation there is no reason for a conservative management therefore termination of pregnancy controlling the bp prophylactic magnesium sulfate and there is no direct indication for a cesarean section as well so the best answer to choose is option number D. Now let's have a look at the next question. The options I have not provided. However, the question they had asked was arranged in correct sequence for active management of third stage of labor. Now third stage of labor is when you have to deliver the placenta, right? Now in active management of third stage of labor, utrotonics are given immediately after delivery of the baby, right? Uh, delayed cord clamping is followed according to WHO, then controlled cord tractions used to deliver the placenta and uterine massage intermittently can be done right to assess the tone of the uterus right so before doing any of this it's quite obvious that if there is another fetus on its way to delivery then first that fetus will have to be delivered right so check for any other fetus it's it's a logical question right it's a logical step that you will check for any other fetus so correct sequence would be checked for any other fetus because if there is a second twin to deliver along the way then you can't start with the active management and it's not third stage of labor has not yet begun now both fetus have to deliver so check for any other fetus then utrotonics then controlled cord traction to deliver the placenta and uterine massage should be last so this is the correct sequence for active management of third stage of labor. In the options provided, this should have been the correct sequence. Now, let's look at the next question. Which of the following is correctly matched, right? So this was a question where uh, two columns were given and you had to match. Uh, you, you don't have to match, but you had to uh, answer which of the following were correctly matched, right? So let's have a look. Uh, chorionic villus sampling is done between 9 to 10 weeks of gestation. Now this is a wrong statement. See when you have questions like this where you have multiple correct answers, right? Uh, in those questions, you have to be sure about at least one option because then you can eliminate from A, B, C, D, whatever choices have been provided to you. So let's say we are sure that chorionic villus sampling is not done between 9 to 10 weeks. If I say that chorionic villus sampling is done any time between 10 to 13 weeks, right? Early chorionic villus sampling is not done. So I'm sure that this option is not correctly matched. So if this is not matched correctly, this is not correct, then option number A and B are out. Okay. Now option number C and D, 2, 4, 2, 3. Okay. So let's see. Amniocentesis done between 15 to 20 weeks. 
Yes, this is correct. Amniocentesis is done in the second trimester. It can be done anytime between 15 to 20 weeks. It can be done even beyond that also. But when it is typically done for, uh, you know, karyotyping for a Down syndrome affected fetus, it's typically done between 15 to 20 weeks. That's the correct answer. Then fetal blood sampling done between 15 to 20 weeks. Now fetal blood sampling, we are talking about uh, PUBS, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling or chordocentesis, right? So for this, we have to sample the umbilical vein and it is ideally done anytime beyond 18 weeks, okay? It's not done earlier than that. It's not recommended to be done earlier than that. The one place we have studied fetal blood sampling is to assess for fetal hemoglobin uh, for uh, detection of fetal anemia or fetal intrauterine transfusion in RH affected fetuses, right? So it is done any time beyond 18 weeks, right? So this is also not correct, right? So we see it's either 3 is correct, either 4 is correct. So option number 3 is incorrect. It's not correct. So the correctly matched options are 2 and 4. Fetoscopy, fairly simple, is visualization of the fetus. Okay, scopy is to visualize right and fetoscopy would be visualization of the fetus so advanced fetoscopic techniques are now available in higher centers where uh, you know we can visualize the fetus in utero we can also in one place we've studied fetoscopic uh, visualization of the fetus is uh, fetoscopic laser photocoagulation in ttts affected pregnancies we studied it there right so fetoscopy fairly simple is visualization of the fetus and that is correct matched as well so option number c is correctly matched rest all options are or uh, rest all options 1 2 1 3 2 3 is also not correctly matched so the correct way to approach such questions because when you when answering in exams you have to think quickly right so when you have to think quickly regarding options you need to be sure about at least one option that will most of the time eliminate at least two of your options and help you arrive at the correct answer. Now, next question, the image shows which procedure being performed. So we can see here that the needle is introduced into the amniotic cavity and amniotic fluid is getting aspirated. So this is amniocentesis, right? So to look at the other images of chorionic villus sampling this is chorionic villus sampling where a catheter is introduced via the cervix it can be transcervically done or it can be transabdominally done as well but then the sample is taken from the chorionic villi so that is what is being shown in this image this is cvs on the right and on the left side we are seeing a needle being introduced inside the umbilical cord blood sample of fetus is taken from the umbilical vein this is chordocentesis or fetal blood sampling okay now let's have a look at the next question all of the following are non-contraceptive benefits of OCPs as well. So, yes, we know OCPs decreases the risk of endometrial cancer. OCPs decrease the risk of ovarian cancer also, right? All contraceptive methods, they decrease the absolute risk of ectopic pregnancy because they prevent pregnancies. They're very effective in pre preventing pregnancies. So, yes, uh, decreased risk of ectopic pregnancy is also true. However, Decreased risk of STIs like HIV, not true. For prevention of HIV transmission, condoms, right? Barrier methods like condoms, they are beneficial, right? Not oral contraceptive pills. So this is a wrong statement. This is false statement. So all of the following are non-contraceptive benefits except decreased risk of STIs like HIV. Next question, which of the following is a protein hormone secreted from the placenta? Now, again, there is a discrepancy regarding the recall of options from this question, but this is the closest that we can be. So LH and FSH, they are, uh, you know, glycoprotein hormones. HCG is also glycoprotein hormone and GNRH is also a polypeptide protein 
hormone but they are specifically asking you secreted from the placenta so the correct answer is hcg right hcg is the protein hormone that is secreted from the placenta mainly that's the main hormone next question a young girl is seen with primary amenorrhea she is short statured with webbed neck and widely spaced nipples ultrasound shows hypoplastic uterus with streak gonads what's the diagnosis again they are asking you questions on primary amenorrhea and its differential diagnosis in this form so this is a very straightforward question short stature and the stigmata of turner syndrome so the answer here is turner syndrome mrkh syndrome is mayer rokitansky kuster hauser syndrome where there is mullerian a genesis so the uterus will be absent in mrkh syndrome right in kolman syndrome there is congenital deficiency of gnrh and there is anosmia the uterus is also not hypoplastic right the gonads are also not streak gonads in kolman syndrome and the height is also normal in kolman syndrome and the stigmata is isn't there like web neck and widely spaced nipples with androgen insensitivity syndrome again the it's a tall statured female with absent uterus and with gonads as testes so rest of the question rest of the options are not the answer it's again a straight forward question with clear cut clues given in the option uh, given in the question so answer is turner syndrome next question all of the following can cause non immune fetal high drops except right so non immune fetal high drops meaning fetal high drops that is uh, happening um, because of reasons other than um, you know rh incompatibility so these are non immune fetal high drops the most common cause of non immune fetal high drops is fetal cardiovascular system anomalies uh, followed by fetal aneuploidies like turner syndrome and everything right or fetal chromosomal abnormalities and other than that fetal infections can also cause non immune high drops now the torch group of infections can cause non immune fetal high drops right now hiv if you look at hiv also if the mother has hiv then the fetus can have vertical transmission of hiv predominantly during the intrapartum period during the period of delivery there is risk of maternal to fetal um, or maternal to newborn maternal to child hiv transmission and hiv is not considered to be a teratogenic a uh, virus right so placental transmission of hiv virus is uh, hardly uh, happening right so hiv does not cause non immune fetal high drops your hsv toxo uh, rubella the torch group of infections they can cause non immune fetal high drops and also i would like to point out here another very important fetal infection which can cause non immune fetal high drops along with torch is parvovirus b19 infection of the fetus as well right so yes the correct answer here is option number b next question which of the following is not a feature of placental abruption now i have five options in place because i really wasn't sure which four options were there so but nonetheless uh, tender uterus yes is a feature of placental abruption painless vaginal bleeding for most of the recalls said that yes painless vaginal bleeding was an option and painless and causeless vaginal bleeding is a feature of a placenta previa associated bleeding not placental abruption bleeding with a uh, placental abruption associated bleeding pain is usually going to be there dic is also more likely with placental abruption related bleeding uterus larger than pog also associated with placental abruption bleeding and postpartum hemorrhage uh, can be seen in both placenta previa and placental abruption related bleeding as well so painless vaginal bleeding is typically a feature of placenta 
previa. That's why this is the answer here. Next question was to match the following with the drugs and their typical fetal effects. Okay, so most likely these were the drugs asked. There is also doubt whether uh, some other drug was given. So again, uh, at least for your upcoming examination, you should be revising the named, uh, uh, you know, teratogenic manifestations, specifically the ones which are named teratogenic manifestations. Like warfarin is associated with chondrodysplasia. Okay, chondrodysplasia is a situation where there is um, you know defective ossification of the bones so warfarin is matching with depressed nasal bone lithium is matching with epstein anomaly which is a cardiovascular system anomaly in the fetus we all are aware of thalidomide with the uh, focomelia and chloramphenicol is associated with gray baby syndrome so again match the following you had to be sure with one or two of the options okay so uh, once you are sure with one or more of the options you can always eliminate from the options provided now next question now Perimortem cesarean section is done by which method? So I'm sure that many of you students may have been taken aback by this sort of question on a perimortem cesarean section. I think this is the first time this question has been asked. So this is a new question. And if we try to understand a little bit about what perimortem cesarean section is, is when we are doing a cesarean section in a dying woman, a woman who's about to die. Now, why are we doing that? It is in reference to situations where in a pregnant woman for any reason, and especially because of cardiac diseases, if she goes into cardiac arrest and we have to do a resuscitation, CPR resuscitation in the pregnant woman, then since the uterus is enlarged and it is occupying the uh, abdomen and it is pushing the diaphragm up, performing CPR in a pregnant woman becomes very difficult, okay? So that is why a perimortem cesarean section, if you sometimes we wonder that is it done to save the life of the fetus? No, so we can get a live fetus if the method is performed, or if a perimortem cesarean section is performed, you know, typically within four to five minutes, right? But please remember that actually perimortem cesarean section is being done to facilitate cardiopulmonary resuscitation in the pregnant woman, okay, so that the baby is out and the uterus is smaller in size and performing the CPR becomes easier, okay, and technically more feasible. So it is for that reason that perimortem cesarean section is being done. If it is going to be done within four to five minutes, then it has to be done with a lot of rapidity. It has to be very quick, right? So you can't do it through a fan and steel incision because it is going to take time. You want to approach through a lower uterine segment, you know, make up the lower uterine segment identified. It is going to take time. So the usual techniques of performing a cesarean section are not done. Okay, we cannot waste time taking the woman to the OT and doing a perimortem cesarean section, right? So then it is not even done, it is not necessarily done in the OT. You see, if, uh, if the, for example, if the cardiac arrest is happening in a woman who is uh, in the labor room and we have to facilitate CPR and we decide on perimortem cesarean section, then we can't waste time in taking the patient to OT and then doing a perimortem cesarean section. So it will be done wherever the woman is. So it's not necessarily done in the OT. Secondly, it has to be done through the upper uterine segment because that is the segment of the uterus that is going to be easily accessible per abdominal, right? So yes, through the upper uterine segment, okay? So even if few students were not able to, it's, it's, it's not a question for typical for undergraduate level. However, um, like I said, logically speaking, 
answer could have been arrived at through the upper uterine segment because it's very illogical to do a perimortem cesarean section through a fan and steel incision and take the patient in the OT or try to approach through the lower uterine segment because all of that is going to make the process time consuming and you know just um, uh, the, the purpose of performing a perimortem cesarean section is to facilitate cardiopulmonary resuscitation in the pregnant woman and then if you have to do that under those circumstances it has to be done with uh, a lot of rapidity uh, so that is why the answer is through upper uterine segment now next question is which component of hpv virus is used in making the hpv vaccine now this is a repeat question it has been asked earlier also and hpv uh, vaccine the human papilloma virus vaccine for cervical cancer is a recombinant uh, inactivated vaccine it does not contain the uh, viral dna please remember so e6 e7 oncoproteins of course we're not putting oncoproteins in the vaccine it is made up of the viral capsid protein okay and the viral capsid protein that is used is l1 this is the component uh, of hpv virus that is used in making the hpv vaccine next question now this is a controversial question i say it controversial because uh, proper recall of this question uh, was not possible but let's see let's see um, the, i have framed a question around this um, uh, so that we can understand uh, the uh, essence of the question now according to the anemia mukt bharat scheme what is the treatment of mild to moderate anemia in a woman who's 34 weeks of gestation now again recalls were uh, inconsistent regarding whether it was beyond 34 less than 34 exactly 34 but let's stick to this question that i have framed what is the treatment of mild to moderate anemia in a woman who is 34 weeks of gestation so you would wonder that do you have to memorize the anemia mukt bharat scheme and everything but you know when i when you when you uh, go through my uh, anemia lectures you'd realize that yes mild to moderate anemia early on in pregnancy that means less than 34 weeks of gestation there is uh, you can always start the treatment with oral iron and folic acid tablets right and beyond 34 weeks of gestation however uh, since she is near to term, uh, we want to ensure compliance, right? We uh, want to ensure that we we give her the required dosage of uh, oral iron. So, in uh, you know, uh, uh, injectable iron preparations are preferred once the woman is beyond 34 weeks of gestation. Early on in gestation also, uh, you know, we can go for uh, injectable iron preparations if the woman is not tolerating oral iron, right? So, the indications for giving injectable iron are simply two right the two indications are one if the woman is not tolerating oral iron to ensure compliance we have to give right secondly we prefer it when women are in advanced gestation beyond 34 weeks so that we ensure that we have given her all the required dosage again technically it is to ensure compliance only right now let us look at these options what is the treatment of mild to moderate anemia in a woman who's 34 weeks of gestation now since he's 34 i am more in favor of giving injectable iron so i would say i would not go for twice daily or thrice daily oral iron folic acid i am more in favor of giving injectable iron now option number c again there's a discrepancy regarding the options also now oral iron folic acid plus iron sucrose well i would not say plus iron sucrose because see oral iron and injectable iron they are not given together if we are deciding to give i uh, injectable iron in any form iron sucrose or whichever form of injectable iron we are giving we have to stop oral iron at least 24 hours before giving the injectable iron they're not given together so I'm not in favor of these uh, three options. However, injectable ferric carboxy, carboxymaltose is a new injectable form of iron. We can give that if not tolerating oral iron. So I think, yes, this is the true answer. This is the best answer to choose. Now, 
let's also revise the treatment of anemia amongst pregnant women according to the anemia mukt bharat scheme and this has this flow chart i have taken up from the um, national health mission uh, training toolkit as well so if you go through this flow chart you will see that if the hemoglobin is less than 11 that is the definition of anemia if it's mild to moderate anemia right and if the gestational age is less than uh 34 weeks then you can give oral iron right two tablets of oral iron folic acid that's fine if the gestational age is less than 34 weeks right but she is not taking oral iron she is not compliant she is not compliant because she is having intolerable side effects then obviously you're going to go for parenteral iron which can be iv iron sucrose or ferric carboxy maltose right iv iron sucrose is generally preferred it is available in the government of india supply free of cost but yes ferric carboxy maltose is also a new available uh, injectable iron formulation which can definitely be used right then if the gestational age is more than 34 weeks like i said if it's more than 34 weeks already i want to ensure that whatever it is her deficiency of iron i should give that iron to build up her iron stores i have less of time i cannot rely on oral iron therapy i'm not even sure if she's going to take the entire uh, tablets if she's going to tolerate or no so in all in this situation i prefer parenteral iron right so indications for parenteral iron gestational age less than 34 non compliant to oral iron gestational age more than 34 definitely prefer parenteral iron in cases of mild to moderate anemia if it is severe anemia that means hb is less than 7 less than 7 meaning it could be between 5 to 7 or less than 5 at any time in pregnancy if the hemoglobin is less than 5 any time in pregnancy means doesn't matter she is in the first trimester second trimester third trimester doesn't matter less than 5 is very bad she needs immediate referral of to a higher center for hospitalization for blood transfusion so less than 5 any time in pregnancy management is blood transfusion and for severe anemia where the hemoglobin is between 5 to 7 let's say then in that situation then in that situation again we have to see the period of gestation right so if the hemoglobin is between 5 to 6 and she is less than 34 right then again she will have to go for a referral immediately right and there she can be treated with iv iron or ferric carboxy maltose right so gestational age less than 34 weeks hp 5 to 7 referral to a uh, district hospital or to a higher center for injectable iron hb 5 to 7 and the gestational age is more than 34 weeks immediate hospitalization for blood transfusion right so with this flow chart we can remember right we can remember two indications of parenteral iron right so parenteral iron can be given in mild to moderate anemia cases when the gestational age is more than 34 weeks indication number 1 parenteral iron is preferred when she is uh, less than 34 weeks even in mild to moderate anemia when she is not able to tolerate oral iron right and the other indication of parenteral iron would be if she has severe anemia and her gestational age is less than 34 weeks right so these are the three important indications for parenteral iron right so with this way and with this flow chart we have to memorize for attempting questions however one thing i want to emphasize here that again students find it very difficult to memorize flow charts so understand the logic okay like i said that the logic for parenteral iron is to ensure compliance and for uh, any situation where the woman is not able to tolerate oral iron okay now moving on next question a woman is 8 weeks pregnant which of the following signs can be elicited and multiple correct options were there so gudel sign is softening of the cervix oc under sign are the pulsations of uh, uterine artery which can be felt through the lateral vaginal fornix these are signs which can be elicited early on elicited early on in pregnancy by 8 weeks so yes yes 
lightning is uh, you know a sign which is uh, a, a symptom that is uh, elicited uh, by pregnant women uh, when the head drops down into the pelvis and that happens at term so this is not the answer at 8 weeks pregnancy and ballotment so ballotment is uh, when uh, there is let's say the uterus uh, can in be imagined as a balloon the amniotic fluid can be imagined as the fluid inside the balloon and then the fetus inside right let's say a ball inside the balloon so when you tap uh, the uh, uterus from one end you can feel the fetal part on the other end right so this is a sign that can be elicited on abdominal examination then it is called as external ballotment external ballotment can be elicited as early as 20 weeks of gestation not before that so there has to be a significant amount of amniotic fluid and a small baby inside to for us to be able to elicit the external ballotment so yes 20 weeks is around about that time when external ballotment that means ballotment on per abdominal examination can be elicited internal ballotment is the same principle but we do it per vaginally okay we tap or poke from below uh, from the vaginal root and we try to tap the cervix right and we can feel the fetal uh, head you know striking our fingers that is internal ballotment same principle but then again it can be elicited between 16 to 28 weeks uh, between that time and uh, a ballotment is not a sign of early pregnancy i mean i don't expect uh, my undergraduate students to elicit internal ballotment but uh, again since this is an mcq based pattern examination i told you that yes uh, hoodle sign osiander sign are seen in early pregnancy lightning and ballotments are not seen in early pregnancy now the next question again vagitis uterinus uh, not a very conceptual question simply a straightforward you knew it or you did not know it um, it's cry of fetus in utero which is a cry of unborn baby a rare phenomena uh, sometimes described in case reports where uh, especially uh, in situations where during the course of labor when the you know membranes rupture and air happens to enter the uterine cavity and the baby can then uh, aspire that and you know we can have a cry of fetus in utero or a cry of an unborn baby called as vagitis uterinus so this was the question um, they had asked and it is again like you either knew it or you did not know it you probably read about it or heard about it and then you could have answered this question otherwise it was simply safer to leave this question if you had no idea and uh, with this i finish off the discussion of the uh, questions and if there are any questions that i have left any more things that you recall any corrections to the options or to the question format you want to make uh, feel free to do so uh, on the comment uh, section and uh, i shall be waiting for your responses thank you Thank you.